welcome to the Mitchell Sentinel Podcast. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you, Robert. Same right back at you. You got anything to say, Lily? Happy Father's Day. Way to go, Lily. So we're going to talk about fathers today, I guess. Yeah. Dad's yeah, got that's figured a, out. That's a good subject. For the most part, we wouldn't be here without them. That's exactly right. They contribute quite a bit. I, uh, I did this earlier this morning at church for uh, my father. Uh, he's been gone since 1996, but every day he tends to uh, keep on teaching me things that I didn't learn when he was personally teaching me them. So, uh, in about 1946, <clears throat> uh, my dad gave my sister and me the probably the biggest gift he ever gave us. Uh, he uh, he went off to alcohol college down in Raleigh Hills in Portland and took at the time what they call the cure. Yeah, what was the cure? I've heard well, of the cure. They take the cure and they just ply you with alcohol and make you deathly ill. They found out later that sometimes it killed people. <laughs> they so give them too they much. just gave you as much alcohol as you could take? Yeah, and it just kept applying it to you and applying it to you. And pretty soon when you got sick on it, the theory was that it, you just your brain triggered to the sickness more than the, the alcohol was giving you. Oh. And uh, you didn't want to go through that hell again. I don't, so it if, doesn't seem like an what, effective what, training. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, it was kind of crude, but uh, with my dad, it worked. So that was good. And um, so uh, in 1978, I give that same gift to my sons. Uh, and I believe today that the reason is uh, they're good fathers is because of that gift. Well, I don't think I've never met a cannon that could handle liquor all that well. So. No, well. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, happy Father's Day to Robert Cannon, oh, thank you. Dexter Rutherford, and Mark Cannon. Uh, it's a great thing, you know. I I remember growing up. You you you, th you think now and then you. I remember one incident when we. I guess this might have been back about nineteen fifty four, fifty five. We. We had this humongous TV set, and it was black and white. And it, I think at they the made big ones. Well, it, big black and white ones. No, big bulky ones. It wasn't oh. big screen. It and was just screen huge was on, tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and and uh, our TV wasn't that great, but and then on the back of this great big Zenith TV, it had to be a Zenith, seemed like. Anyhow, on the back it says, "Warning: Do not go behind beyond this backing on this." TV because there's three gazillion yep. volts in there. Okay. And so my dad was going to adjust it, and to do this adjusting thing, he had to take this screwdriver and take the back off from it and stick a screwdriver in a certain spot and twist it. And so he has me on the front looking at the picture while he's in there twisting this. Did he ride the lightning? Uh, no, he didn't, not per se, but what happened, he was in there twisting this thing, and uh, I had my flash camera at the time. The big flash camera had a big bulb, and it just really flashed. He thought he he thought he was riding a lightning. Oh, so you tricked him with the flash? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I got this picture of my dad. This awesome picture of partially covered half his face with the TV, and one eye showing out behind the TV. But this eye is huge. I'm telling you, he looked like kind of like a cyclops or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was funny. He thought he'd had a heart attack. He I fell he over. Cursed the, you too. Uh, oh well, yeah, he did. Yeah, he was. They didn't send him to curse school. I know that much. Yeah, but your dad through the time your dad gives you a lot of advice and everything, and most likely you probably don't he adhere to it lately. You know, uh, 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 right then, but lately you probably uh, start thinking about your dad after he's gone and say, "Hey, I know what he's trying to teach me now." Better late than never, Especially right? Especially when you run, are confronted with your children and the same problem arises. Uh, I guess one of the favorite things that the dad might say is, says, we're not lost. We're just not sure where we are. <laughs> They're never good at taking directions. So is that a, a list of dad quotes you have there? Well, this is words of wisdom that I uh, I stole out of the roundup oh, uh, okay. this week. Uh, 
I hope they don't mind me sharing it with them. I'm sure. I give them a little advertising. Yeah, just say yeah. say where you got it. Cite your sources. Yeah, that's right. That's right. College. Yeah. It says uh, I, this is one that I never. My dad never told me this, but I could understand it. It says, "Eat your vegetables. It'll keep your poop loose." <laughs> uh, and wh- once in a while, you'd ju- get in front of that TV set that he was working on so diligently, and uh, he'd uh, say, uh, you make a better door than you do window. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's yeah, a popular yeah, yeah, one. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, if I didn't love you so much, I wouldn't punish you. I'd let you do whatever you wanted. And then a lot of times he's trying to make a point, and he'll say, did I stutter? Don't forget to check the oil. That's always a good one. Grandpa Cannon is really good about that. I'll give you three guesses, and the first two don't count. So when you got to that third one, you knew that was probably it. Okay. You're not leaving my house dressed like that. What will other parents think? I think that's mostly for daughters, right? Well, maybe, but, you know, I wore some pretty crazy clothes when I was. Uh, yeah, you continue think, to. Yeah. Your whole life. I was one of the first kids in town to have white buck shoes like Pat Boone. Okay. And then I think I bought a pair of pink ones later on, too, that I wore. Uh, always, this is always a good one. This hurts. This, it's going to hurt me a lot worse than it hurts you. But you couldn't understand it when he was using the switch on you. How was he feeling all that pain? <laughs> yeah. It's when you used to be able to spank kids. Says. I don't care what other people are doing. I'm not everybody's father. I thought that was kind of good. Uh, and then it, it's another one he'd say, is, it all ends up in the same place anyway. What about, said, I'm built backwards. My feet smell and my nose runs. That happens, <laughs> that happens later in life, I think. <laughs> that gives you some of the... Uh, some of the things that fathers might say. Dadisms. Yeah. So I remember one time, my dad and I, like most dads, you know, by the time I was probably 13 to 18, my dad was dumber than a post. But miraculously, in the next three or four years, he su- really crammed himself because he got a lot smarter. You're surprised at how quickly yeah. and how much he had it's, learned. It's like, yeah, it's like he read the whole encyclopedia, you know. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But my dad and I, we were pretty lucky. We worked together for quite some time too. And uh, all your life. Yeah, most of the life. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, we had the service station, and outside the service station was our truck place where we did all the truck tires. And we had this one inch airline out there and a one inch hose hooked to it to run the big air gun well one day I, we just plugged it in there was no shut off or nothing we just plugged it in well when you got done you just pulled the plug and it snapped out and the hose the hose would shoot out like a shotgun well this particular day the timing was just right when he walked around the corner i undercoupled the hose and it hit him right between the <laughs> eyes just like a bullet <laughs> <laughs> he's sitting there. He was sitting there in this dazed look on his face. He's about Why the hell about to that? go down. What the hell's that all about? Well, this thing had a, cut a little donut right out of his head, right out of his forehead, and it was just kind of hanging by just a little thread. Well, I remember that scar on his head. I didn't know how he got it. Yeah, I reached up. I reached rather than pat, pat it back in. I just reached up and pulled the rest of it off. So he went through the rest of his life with a donut on his forehead. <laughs> that was kind of funny <laughs> for me. I, you know, yeah, I yeah, wasn't, so much. yeah I, I don't recall him telling it, but you know what happened? Our safety uh, measures went up after that. We went out and you put a out, valve on and there. We didn't put you? a valve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I say lost lessons learned, you know? Yeah. Well, if you had two of those scars, it would be bad. Yeah. Yeah. Another time, uh, I wrote a poem about this experience, and uh, it says, uh, if I can get positioned right and get my chords right here and everything, I'll just pop it out of here. Let's take some 
takes finesse doing a podcast. Oh, it does. You know, you got all this information around here. You got words and technology. I did. Uh, I did church this morning at at the Baptist Church in Mitchell because our regular minister was gone, and uh, halfway through it, I lost the, the lyrics to a song I was going to sing, and and then uh, after I got done, I looked down and I found the lyrics to the song I was going to sing, and the I found the uh, words to the poem that I forgot to do. So, oh, well. Hey. So, so that worked out really well. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do this uh, poem that I wrote about my dad. This is a true story, by the way. It said, uh, Mitchell's history has felt the sting of lawlessness in many ways. Indian wars, sheep and cattle wars, and numerous outlaws influenced her past days. Necessity sometimes dictates that the law had to be taken into their own hands. Vigilante justice was swift, but mistakes were made, and it was needed at the time in this lawless land. Flash forward to the 1960s. A phone call was answered late one October night. The neighbor had a burglar who was trying to break in. Hurriedly to arms, my dad and I came. Shotguns are weapons of choice. We were going in prepared to win. Now, my dad, he slept a la natural. And what a sight, a 260-pound naked man dressed only in a shotgun. I at least had my pants on. I went, I went one way and my dad the other. We were anxious to get the job done. I a hope few, he had shoes on. <laughs> A few minutes into the search, I heard my dad yell. Thinking the worst, I hollered back, Are you all right? He replied, Yeah, but your mother left the sprinklers on, and I'm wet as cold as hell. Well, we didn't catch the burglars that night. They made a hasty treat from our town, and we're still trying to figure out were they scared by the shotguns or the sight of my dad? <laughs> well, that was a common theme back in the day, waking up in the middle of the night to go find the burglars breaking into the station or Oh, somewhere. well, neighbor's house. Well, this happened to be the Huddleston's house next door. Lois had got up to use the bathroom, looked out the back window, and this guy was trying to break in on the porch, and they'd already burglarized the pastime and the... Uh, uh, store all in the same night yeah yeah same group there was a bunch of them and and they were staying at the hotel we chased them back in a hotel but we were a little reluctant to go in there and get them with our shotguns and everything but uh yeah and grandpa being buck naked yeah yeah we just we didn't want to expose a lot of people to that <laughs> i mean uh-huh. yeah yeah that was uh like i said it had been kind of rough but i think fathers do have a serious side and uh i think god had uh pretty serious side when they uh when he uh made the fathers and so this poem is uh entitled dad god to the strength of a mountain the majesty uh, the majesty of a tree the warmth of a summer sun and the calm of a quiet sea the generous soul of nature the comforting arms of night the wisdom of all ages, and the power of an eagle's flight. The joy in the morning in spring, the patience of eternity, and the depth of the family's need. Then God combined these qualities, and when there was nothing more to add, he knew his masterpiece was complete. So then he called it Dad. Did you write that one? No, I did not. I don't remember even who would, who, I, you know, I, I tell people it's probably written by Anonymous and that I changed my name to uh, Anonymous to or? Robert Anonymous oh. Cannon. That way I can claim anything that's out there in there public, public domain. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you can get much royalties uh, that way though. I know, but you know, I've seen, I've seen musicians do it. <laughs> I said, hey, you plagiarize everything. Hey, I, Everything comes out of either, I say the preachers plagiarize everything because everything comes out of the Bible. And then the uh, 
the writers write, they plagiarize everything from the dictionary. Well, if, so, you, if you aren't a, a very good thief, you aren't a very good musician, that's uh, what they say. Well, yeah, I guess so. Well, it's kind of like a rock hound. They won't steal money, but they'll steal rocks, and I think that's the way it is with musicians. They'll uh, steal songs. Well, there's nothing new under the sun. As, as they well, that's here. true. They just keep keep moving it on. Yep. Uh, you got any uh, favorite memories of your father? No. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here. No. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have any, huh? No. Oh, uh, let's see. Can't remember. I always thought it was pretty funny, and Mark would cut you when with the chainsaw or a knife. Yeah, yeah, that was skinning a deer or cutting a elk, elk or or, or chainsaw. Cut, chainsaw my leg with while well, we were cutting wood. Cause I, I the only reason I find it funny is I'm just happy it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess if he was going to find a subject, he couldn't have found a tougher one to work on. <laughs> and he made me that way, so it worked out good. Well, I always was pretty happy that you did quit drinking. That always made me feel pretty proud. And every time I decide to stop drinking for a while, it seems to help I, have that example. I think probably uh, you wouldn't have had a father if I uh, hadn't have quit. So Yeah, I think mom I, would have killed you. I, th- I th- Well, that or I'd, <laughs> I'd have killed myself probably. I thank God every day that. I uh, I said that's the one good thing is when I uh, I leave here to go to work or go anywhere else, I'm not going to uh, get a DUI or I'm not going to kill somebody driving drunk. Yeah, well, that's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I all right, they thought that was pretty funny during this COVID shutdown that they would keep the liquor stores open but uh, make tell you you can't gather for AA. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what the yeah. heck's up with that? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, they did the same thing. You know, they would uh, they keep the liquor stores and the, and the marijuana stores open because, you know. Keep what, people satiated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they could, uh, you know, that, that made it more culpable, I guess, maybe. Oh, well, yeah, I, I think. And plus, it makes the state a little more revenue because they got a pretty big tax on it, and they didn't want to see that go down. But poor Joe Schmo that's got the restaurant on the street over there, he – uh yeah, he had to pay the price. Yeah, but you know it had a double-edged sword because the, uh, the those restaurants and everything they have to buy their booze through a liquor store, or state liquor store, or uh, a distributor that collects a tax for them and everything. So I'm I'm sure that though they did stay open, they lost a little revenue there. Well, I guess AA doesn't generate too much revenue. That's no, why. <laughs> no, no. And you couldn't gather. I'm sure there's a Zoom. AA meetings and stuff, but uh, I had a pretty interesting, uh, a funny memory about Grandpa Cannon because remember every hunting season, and he Grandpa always sat on the bench there, and uh, and he you know uh, man the gas pumps. We spent a lot of winters just sitting there taking turns taking naps and and seeing who would go next. But he uh, always complained about having to get up and go uh, fill up somebody who just wanted enough to top off their tank. And especially hunting season, because back in the day, cars didn't couldn't travel as far as they do now on a tank of gas. These big old gas guzzling pickups back in the day. So they would just top off because they already filled up in Primeville and they were headed out to the hinterlands where you wouldn't have fuel for a couple of days. So and Grandpa said, "God damn deer hunters, and sons <laughs> of bitches, wish they just stayed home." <laughs> every year, all, all, they, all they want is just a cup full of gas to get on. <laughs> and every year they would uh. He would say you'd hear the same dang thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the funny part is that the year after he died, that hunting season, his picture fell off the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could just hear those words. Yeah. He, uh, it, it worked for him though. I mean, he hated to get up and go wait on a, uh, motorcycle. Cause oh, he, yeah. it, man, they did. So he, one day he's out there grumbling and they don't hold just a teacup full, you know, yeah. and he's got the bitch. And so this one guy pulls up and, Got to talking to this guy a little bit after he got over being mad. And then he, they have, you have to be real careful. You can't spill any gas on the motorcycle or anything or overfill. And this before they had the habit of yeah. just giving it yeah. to so him and having to fill yeah, themselves. Yeah. So uh, anyhow, he got talking to this old boy. He says, uh, you're pretty old to be riding one of these things. He said, uh, how much one of these things costs? Well, at the time, I think uh, a new Harley, the big fancy ones, probably runs $25,000, something like that. And, man, that really set my dad's brain in motion. Mm-hmm. So he goes in, and next time his broker calls him, 
He said, I want to buy some Harley stock. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, well, how much do you want? He said, how much is it? And they told him X amount of dollars. I think it was like 15 bucks or something back in there. He said, well, give me 400 shares. So he buys 400 shares of Harley stock. And then it's starting to really take off a little bit. Yeah, that was well uh, before the, that it, big. I mean, there was kind of a renaissance of Harleys yeah, about yeah, 20, 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah, so he was thankful they were all buying new ones because them oil dripping things would pull up and you have to clean up the mess after mm -hmm. they left. But anyhow, he bought the 400 share, shares of Harley. Uh, and uh, Harley. Harley. And then the uh, about two years down, it, when they were doing so good, the stock split. Now he had 800 shares of Harley. <laughs> so he was really feeling good. So he didn't really care that much about after he, after he bought all the Harley stock to wa uh, walk out and yeah, ha hand the time. gas nozzle to the Harley owners because he knew every time that they're... guy had helped him out quite a bit. Yep. And uh, when it got to a certain point, I, I, I inherited, my sister and I inherited this, the Harley stock and, uh, we we sold 400 shares of it and uh, bought some other stuff, which has done well, really well, everything. But I was a little reluctant to do it because I didn't want my dad rolling over in the grave, you know. I, yeah, like I spent yeah, good money yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, I would keep that Harley stock. But, <laughs> you know, uh, and I told him, I said, you know, I you said that these co do cost $25,000. But I said, you know where Harley makes most of their money? is on the clothes, that yeah. guy, Harley guy's... Uh, Anything with a Harley emblem or oh, yeah. a shirt, leathers, whatever, they've got it out there, and they get that's where they make their all, all, a lot of their money. Yeah, yeah. So it worked out pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems like Harley's probably still doing pretty good. Yeah. We another time we I was we were up. I asked uh, John Husband when he owned all this land. I said, "Hey, uh, how about writing me out a permit?" He said. Uh, so I can go hunting on your place. They had what they call Private Game Management Corporation, PGMC, I think, or something like that. Anyhow, uh, he said, uh, well, nah. He said, I don't think I want to do that. He said, i tell you what. Why don't you just keep on sneaking in like you're doing anyway? He said, uh, it's more fun that way. So I didn't get a permit, but I got sort of permission. Yeah, yeah he had something. Well, permission. anyhow, we're up on top of Keys Mountain this one time. My dad and I. And you're talking about Mark Hurt and me. Well, this was something similar to that. <laughs> and we're up there. And, of course, we're in a Jeep because we're not going to get out too far and walk, especially my dad. So we're going up there. And I'm I'm looking off one side of the canyon. He's looking off the other. But the Jeep's still in motion. And we're not going real fast. But we hit a rock in front of us hard enough to stop the Jeep and slam my dad's head into the windshield oh, and break geez. it. <laughs> I said, I, I, he was sitting there holding this big lump on his head, right, right about really close where the scar was from the air accident. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, I said, you know, I think I'll get out and walk over this ridge and hunt down this way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was there. He was there uh, doing a few of his oaths. He was so famous for. Yeah. Well, I, I wish I would have been there the time you tried to pull down the elk off the hill with the rope. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I that was a smart, smart thing. <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> you you just had to have it. You just want to know, don't you? Want me humiliate me? Well, no. I just want to. I want to know because it's a pretty funny story, and you might as well tell it on yourself because I don't know the details. <clears throat> okay. Well, we're up uh, Mahogany Ridge, and it's raining this morning, but it's the opening to, uh, Saturday to go elk hunting, and we had Grandpa Cole, Mark, and myself. And we're uh, going up through there, and I said, boy, this, we're going to get stuck here. We ought to just stop here. And about that time, we were stuck. Well, anyhow, we got out. I said, well, this would be a good place to go hunting. So I'm going up one side of the canyon, and Mark's going up the other, and Grandpa's the only smart one there. He's sitting in the pickup till we can get back and get unstuck. Well, it's just about getting daylight, and I hear a shot, boom, right over where Mark was. He gets on the radio, and he says, uh, Dad, I got one down, but I don't know whether it's a cow <laughs> or it's a bull. <laughs> I said, you stay on this radio. There'll be a game warden in a minute to show up, and he'll tell you which sex it is. <laughs> so he got off the radio. So I, 
I, I go across the canyon, I walk up there where this thing is. It's right in a bunch of mahoganies. So then I have to walk back, get a chainsaw, go back up the hill, and cut all the mahogany out and make a trail down to get this nice four-point bull elk out. And Mark has gotten it at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And this makes it uh, this makes it legal because it is a bull. Yeah. So uh, so anyhow, I give it a tug. Grandpa's still setting the pickup. Mark, he isn't much help. But anyhow, I give it a tug and it don't go. I give it another little tug and it rolls a little bit, gets hung up some more brush. I said, uh, heck with this. So I grab this rope and I tie it around my waist and I loop around his horns. So I give it a pull. I'm leaning way down the hill and really going, and pretty soon this elk breaks loose. Well, every time the elk rolls, he's throwing the rope. The rolls. rope gets shorter, <laughs> and all that's going through my mind is says, "Really dumb elk hunter gored by dead bull elk." <laughs> that was going to be the headlines for the day. <laughs> but luckily, yeah, he rolls up against the juniper tree and stops and saves me, and we were close enough to get it to the pickup by then. Oh, that was a pretty good. But then we had to have Bob Powell come pull us out. He was he was hunting somewhere close by. Yeah, he was just down over the hill. But hmm. <laughs> so that was that was a good story. Yeah, that, was, that elk tasted pretty good. Yeah, so that was with my father-in-law for the Father's Day story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's a bunch of those. So I always like the stories about you guys going down and apprehending the people at the station, you and Grandpa. Well, you know that <laughs> happened. Uh, we moved down here on that highway, and uh, people come by, and they looked at that as their own personal ATM. And we didn't keep any money there, but they, uh, as they established wh- how they break in, we had three windows for ventilation on the west side of the building, which was really nice. But they would b- knock the windows out or pry them out or over or something. Mm-hmm. And so every, as they did that, we replaced the windows with boards, and boarded up the three windows. And then they did the back one once. We had to board it up and we put in a swamp cooler back there, and that was the end of that. But then they, I think it was on a Friday night. No, it was on a Thursday night. They drove up to the main window of the door, and they broke it out. Of course, reached inside and opened up their thing. And so I go over to Primeville on a Friday to get, a piece of glass to replace the glass in the door. Well, the guy says, what What broke it? He said, well, I said, this guy had hit it with a deal. So he said, okay, right, I got a deal for you. Got this plexiglass, and it's like a quarter inch or better thick. And he said, it's unbreakable. Okay, so we put it in Friday. Saturday night, I go down, and after we hear the disturbance, They'd already left, but anyhow, they had broken the plexiglass, the unbro- the unbreakable one out. Yeah, and uh, they'd burglarized. We got six times. We got burglarized like six times there before, and finally, we told the judge. Said, "Judge, we uh, we got to do something. We we got no police protection over here to per se or nothing like that." He said, "We we're gonna have to arm ourselves and start doing." It. Oh no, you can't you can't do that. You can't shoot nobody. You're going to get in real big trouble. I said, well, we, Dad said, well, we're not going to let hide under the bed and let them steal everything we got. Yeah. So we brought out the shotguns. Well, they had a, a um, intercom that was always open, always on at the station. And Grandpa, who lived across the creek, had uh, had the other end of the intercom in his bedroom. Yeah. So he could hear what was hear, going on in yeah. there. And so he'd, he'd sleep with that. Yeah. And then... He'd call me, and I would come down from town, and he would go around, and we had him boxed in pretty close if, yeah, we, so you could, if we got there in time. But this one time, particular time, we we had coffee in there, of course, and we had what they call solo cups, the plastic ones. Well, he says, I'm hearing noise over there. Somebody's breaking in. So we go over, and I come down. Quiet. Nobody's been in there. Nothing's missing. It's just quiet. So we go back home. About a half hour later, he called me. He said, I hear that noise again. Well, after two or three times that night doing this, I walk over right underneath the intercom where the garbage can is, and all these solo cups that have been used laying in this garbage can, I hear a noise. And during the night, this mouse had fell 
into the garbage can where all these solo cups that he'd jump up and try to get out. But yet when we come in, he would quiet down so we couldn't find him. So we had uh, we had quite a little uh, laugh over the, the the mice situation that night. Yeah, I always like the one where you went down and apprehended a guy. You got him, had him out there on the and Aunt Sue was in town too, for some reason. So you ha- had him apprehended and laying in the gravel there and guns on him, and and then Aunt Sue had her pistol. And you and Grandpa made her stay outside and hold the gun on him <laughs> while the police well, we, uh, showed up, and you went in and made coffee. Uh, well, that, what we really we thought there might be some more guys inside. Oh, uh, I thought you went in and had coffee. Oh no, no, no. We made made made, made some in there in, in that night, but that was funny too because I had been drinking to excess that evening, and I was kind of hung over a little bit and a little bit foggy headed and. Probably a little drunk still. It, well, yeah. And then, anyhow, I just came down in the pickup, and I had the pistol laying on the seat. Well, I, I usually p- put the, uh, turn the key off on one side, put the put the gear shift in gear, and uh, shut everything down, and grab the pistol all in one motion. Is that that 68 Ford? Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. The one with a hole in the firewall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did this that night. And the pickup being all closed, and I was packing. I had a thirty-eight pistol that time, and I hit that pistol, and the gun went off. I hit the trigger, and it shot right between my feet, right through the firewall of my pickup. And all of a sudden, all I could hear was pee. <laughs> so when I apprehended the criminal coming out of the window, I'm screaming at him because I can't hear nothing, <laughs> can't hear. and he thinks I'm crazier than what I really am, you know. <laughs> So we laid him down out there, and we called uh, we called Prineville, I think it was. Yeah, we called Prineville, and they said, "Well, I'm we're sorry we not we can't roll a unit because uh, you're in Arlington's district. Well, Arlington's 125 miles from here. It's the state Fossil, police. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and Fossil's 40 miles. Yeah. And, and who was uh, Ortho Caldera was probably the sheriff. At yeah, the time. probably. Anyhow, you knew he probably wasn't going to be coming. Anyhow, uh. We had this guy all laid out there and had him stretched out, and he's getting dimples in his chin from his chin touching the gravel. And I told my sister, I said, you stand right over him, and I'm going in and check for something else. And I said, if you hear another noise in there, they probably got me. I said, you just shoot him. <laughs> and he's screaming, I'm alone, I'm alone. <laughs> well, anyhow, back to the phone call to get the police here. They said, uh, you know, we'll have to get somebody out of Arlington. And I said, well, my mom said, we got this guy apprehended. And so, uh, and if nobody wants to come and get him, we'll just shoot the son of a bitch. <laughs> Click. <laughs> I guess they had somebody here pretty quick. 35, mi- 35 minutes later, they had rolled one out. Of, he was here from Prineville. Prineville. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of the way you had to do it. Yeah. Well, Sergeant Don Bussey over there, he said, we just let them go ahead and do what they got to do over there. We just go over and pick up the bodies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the one I remember, I guess this was the one, I think probably the last time somebody broke in there. I can't remember. I'm, I was a little kid, but I remember you almost, you could have had that guy. You should could have shot him. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you didn't, but with the shotgun above him. And he ran out and we had this old red dog. He, he got away and he was over the hill. And is this the same time that Grandma Cannon was shooting at him too? No, this is that was oh. a different time. But uh, the old boy ran up the canyon, and our dog tracked him down. But Don Bussy was like, "Well, I'm sure glad you didn't shoot him because that would have been a hell of a lot of paperwork." Yeah. But after a day or so tracking, chased him out through the hills. He said, "I wish you'd have killed that sucker yesterday." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I always liked the one where Grandma Cannon was shooting, and she was a shorter lady and shooting from grandpa's house towards the station when that was 38 with wad cutters wasn't yeah it? and she was and what the wad cutters were doing she was short and she was hitting the railing with the water cut just with a wad cutter and just barely touching Raising the, the, the t- touching the rail and it was causing the bullet to tumble and this guy could hear the bullets coming through the air <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well anyhow we didn't catch him that night because he took off running but we, uh, I think I'm taking you back maybe to the hospital. Uh, when or, I was a baby? Yeah, uh, and to uh, get checked out or something. Yeah, so we're going to Primeville, Mary and I. 
Well, we're going down 26 and right about where the state highway uh, shop is now. I see this long-haired dude that was doing this, walking down the road, hitchhiking, trying to get a ride out. So I didn't want to turn around and go right back that way. So yeah. I went all the way back. At the time, the Owens Road was all still around open. around the Owens place. And so I came back up the Owens, and the, I think uh, state the state cop was still there filling out forms and everything. I said, if you want to catch the perpetrator, you can uh, catch him down there because I said he's hiding. Hiding, hiking down the road and so he went down there and he's all ready to apprehend this guy and this guy by this time he was give out he, he was he just won. over it yeah yeah but well, that same night my dad <laughs> this guy had a woman and a baby with him and he parked the car way down the lower the lower bridge and he'd walk back up through there so my dad was down checking that car out when my mom started shooting at this dude so my dad didn't want the getaway car to get away, so he took his shotgun and he took off the front tire. <laughs> and so, and so uh, he gets to Primeville, and one of the uh, attorneys over there said, "Well, hey, we'll get him." He said, "We'll get him for reckless endangerment, shooting that out with that baby in the car and everything." Dad didn't know there was anybody in there anyway. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, I think uh, Jim Bodie at the time uh, said, "Nah." You you don't want to represent Bob Cannon because you're part of our firm and he uh, we represent him, so it'd be a conflict. So well, it worked out pretty yeah, good. Yeah, it worked out. Yeah, yeah. Well, that uh, was the that was the seventies for you. you oh know? yeah, oh yeah. I mean, uh, we actually did a recall on the district attorney that year because we had so many burglars and he wouldn't prosecute even when we caught him. Why is that? I just didn't want to. He'd plea bargain down to something and turn them loose or something. Well, this last one's a, this one guy was about six, seven, probably weighed 250. Uh, he wasn't really a big, he was a big fat guy is what he was. <clears throat> well, anyhow, him and this other guy had burglarized us and everything. And so Malcolm comes over, so, well, these are just boys. You don't want to do that. Well, he come to find out. Two days later, that there were escaped felons from the Walla Walla State Prison. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. But and they said that that was the straw. So we went ahead and uh, we, we we recalled. We them. recalled, yeah. Well, it was kind of crazy back in the day. People just drifting and wandering through, and you you knew you would know if somebody's up to no good because a lot of times there wasn't too many outsiders out here. There no. were people that worked here. Well, any any. I'd like to say anybody that wasn't familiar to this area or to the people was automatically a suspect. Well, yeah, and it wasn't, why would anybody come out here? Yeah. It wasn't a tourist area or destination as it is today. Yeah. But there was just people trying to, you know, make Traveling it, through, getting away from something or, yeah. you know, trying to find an easy score or something. Yeah, and so it, yeah. it didn't it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty rough. I've seen my dad... Uh, getting two fights at her place place of business like uh, fisticuffs oh yeah oh wow yeah two brothers here were drunk and they were chasing the the city marshal around and they were going to whoop him up and they run into my dad's place of business and kind of was going to take it over i seen my dad hit this one guy and i i gained a whole new respect for him <laughs> I never wanted him to hit me that way ever. <laughs> Must have laid him out pretty good. Yeah, but then he had a drunk come up from down in uh, the pastime one day, and he wanted trouble. And my dad, he gave it to him right out in front of the dealer. He he hit him, and he worried about two or three days he might get blood poison from hitting this guy in the teeth because oh, yeah. it broke it broke, it broke the skin. Of, yeah, yeah, kind of had a pretty big Sold gash in his hand. Bit. Yeah. Yeah, he said that buck two sucker, <laughs> and I'm using sucker. To, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of Grandpa yeah. Cannon words that we don't use on the podcast. Yeah. I suppose he, he all. My dad always told me he used the same words the preachers did, but he just phrased his different. Yeah, a little more emphasis <clears throat> yeah. here and there. Uh, another thing, another favorite. This is on another dad too. Years ago, we had a new preacher come in and he got some people in they're going to have a revival and everything and so he come down he talking to everybody in town trying to recruit doing his mission and said we're going to have this revival and uh so uh 
he goes down to my dad's place said, we're having a revival here uh, Thursday evening. I'd sure appreciate it if you'd come up. Dad said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you can get Clarence Jones to go, I'll go. <laughs> well, Thursday evening rolled around. And about 6 o'clock, old Clarence, he showed up at my dad's door, knocked on the door and said, you ready to go, Cannon? <laughs> <laughs> he was all in a suit tie and everything oh, gosh. dad had to go in there and spruce up spritz up and everything he thought he was going to uh, get a pass yeah everything. but yeah but anyhow clarence gets him again when they get to church they pass the hat and the plate you know and everything and make the con contribution to the church and the and evangelist or who, the revivalist or whatever and clarence throws in a hundred dollar bill oh shoot <laughs> <laughs> So, Dad had to uh, uh, cop put him up a hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah. bet that hurt. I, I bet Clarence is still laughing over that thing. Oh, he he just saw his chance to get Bob Cannon. Is what <laughs> yeah. he did. Yeah, it was pretty good there. Grandpa should have never opened his mouth about a <laughs> Clarence. Would yeah, go all well, he knew it was a lead pipe cinch. Clarence yeah. would never go. Yeah, and Clarence knew it was too. So he decided he'd just re reverse the deal on him. And yeah, it was a, it was a pretty classic. That's a fair. Friendly competition between yep. two gas station men in Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, oh, that's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, pretty nice. Yeah, I, I, a lot of fond memories of my father hunting and fishing. We uh used to go. We had a lot of power outage back in the day. I don't know why people, you know, but some people shoot the insulator off. The, sometimes the, the the you know the birds would get in there. Yeah, and anyhow. Every time that happened, we kept the fishing poles in the back of the rig, and we'd we'd head to the river. Oh, the power would go out, you just go <clears> fishing. <throat> yeah. So we'd get down the river, and we'd be there for an hour or two, and if we knew the power was on, when we drove the car up, turned the radio on, if we could hear the static and the, the, coming across the power line, so okay. we knew it was time to go home go and quit back fishing. To yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes we did, sometimes we, we did. <laughs> but we knew the power was on anyway, so, yeah. It worked out pretty good. We yeah. Were, um, I, uh, what was this story about uh, you guys went camping up that lake up by Mount Hood Frog Lake Frog yeah. Lake yeah I don't know why my dad my dad is not a camper <laughs> and I don't know how my mother and Angie Ross convinced him to to go but I guess mainly for us kids probably, probably but, so but just to show you we didn't have the only camper we had the only thing camping equipment we had was sleeping bags and a mattress <laughs> And we th threw the mattress well, over the old car and yeah, sleep bags in the down. back. Yeah, yeah, lashed it down there. So we we get over to Frog Lake. We set up camp. Throw the mattress out on the ground. Throw the sleeping bags on and everything. So we we go uh, we go huckleberrying. So we got a real good lead on this one place to go huckleberrying. And I don't know if anybody's ever picked huckleberries. You know, it it must take an eternity to pick a gallon of huckleberries because they uh, they're really tiny. <laughs> Well, we go to this one place, and first thing we do, we run into uh, Mary Cotton Gin and Ruth Moverhill. They were down there. Really? They were, they were down there huckleberry. That's so, a heck of a thing. Yeah. yeah. 100 yeah. miles away. Yeah. So uh, we pick a couple hours and maybe get the bottom of the bucket, and pretty soon Dad, he gets kind of disgruntled. He said, had enough. Yeah, I've had enough. Let's go home. So at that time, the Indians, they would stand by the – or set up a little stand by the highway, and they'd they'd sell huckleberries. And, uh, <laughs> That's and, a smart uh, move. Yeah. After dad, after two nights sleeping on that old mattress and cold ground, he decided that we'd go home and we'd buy our huckleberries. <laughs> well, did he fall through a boat too, or something? Oh, the, yeah. We were. Uh, Collins was draining their full piano reservoir up there. Oh, I thought Waterford. he did that up at Frog Lake. Oh no, no, oh. no! That was a different time. Well. They're draining this, and they said and there's these big cameloops in there. I mean, these are like 26, 28 inches, you know, big fat one. Well, people have been getting them all week. So Dad said, we ought to go up there and get some of them fish. We smoke them and everything. I said, okay. Well, we get up there, and by the time it, the lake has just become a mud bog, and there's a couple little ponds out there in between, but they're separated by mud. Well, Jimmy Collins says, go ahead and use that boat. We got a boat up there. Well, we used the boat, not because it was floating, to get through the mud. Okay. And we're pushing it, and this mud is really gooey, gimey, groomy. The old man said, well, I ain't getting my clothes dirty. So he, 
he bails down to his skivvies. Now, this is another sight. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's pulling the boat. I'm pushing the boat. Well, you know, various degrees of the mud gives you more leverage. And uh, uh, it uh, the, the muddier and the gooier it is, it's probably going to slide. Better, a little bit, yeah. yeah, less resistance. So I'm, and, this, and it's cold. This <laughs> mud is cold. Well... I'm a, I'm a pushing and he's a pulling. Well, we hit one of them really slick spots and I pushed pretty hard and hit the bow of the boat, hit him in the chest, and knocked him back, and there he's sitting up to his neck in mud. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a sight to see. <laughs> I mean, the guy, but, but one thing about it, you, the mud's covering him so much you can't see anything else, so yeah. that's good, yeah. So we get out there and we finally get to the place, but we didn't get fish one, but we got a good, I got a good laugh out of it and, and a great experience. Well, that's one thing. Grandpa had a pretty good sense of humor, even if the joke was on him. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he went with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I guess that about does it. We're running long today. I didn't oh, know yeah. if we'd have well, enough to talk I, about. I hope, I hope everybody enjoyed some of these stories with their, with uh, my father. And, and I hope they will remind you of some of the stories that you had and the fun you had for, <laughs> with your father that uh, yeah. you had forgotten maybe or something. I would tell but, more on dad, but they're just, the, I don't know if the statute of limitations is up or not. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's the problem with growing up here in the sixties and seventies, well, seventies and eighties for me, but gosh, they, they, we didn't it was pretty illegal we we're kind of outlaw out here and so well yeah. all that poaching that was just uh, <laughs> that was uh, i didn't say that uh, you, you all that did, poaching though. was done because it was our, our welfare at the time that That's was our pro, the welfare program and yeah if you didn't have one hanging and one getting ready to go hanging uh, you know you, you had to do that well if you're gonna bring that up i do one of my favorite stories about you is when we went christmas tree hunting we would had this old 1946 <coughs> Willys Jeep. We still have it. And uh, Mom and Mark and I and you, we all ride in the front of that. And then in the back, after we got our Christmas trees up at the ranch, we're coming back down, and there was two dead deer underneath those Christmas trees. <laughs> well, yeah, I said, while we're up here, and we're up here in this Jeep, and we're getting these Christmas trees, why don't we just park a couple old does underneath them? Yeah. And so we did, and we're coming back. Christmas venison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're coming back with the trees stacked on something, and you can see the feet sticking up out of these Christmas <laughs> trees, of these two old doves. And we get right there where you turn in to go to Oakey Flats, yep. and we meet two state troopers. Yeah. And my goodness, Mary just, I said, you might as well just grab a sign that says, we're guilty. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta learn to wave at them and say hi. Mom don't have a poker face. Of course you, <laughs> you, you knew the guys. Oh so uh, yeah. Of course so, you had to stop and talk to them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it made things worse. Well, yeah. yeah. You didn't want to rouse undue suspicion. suspicion. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Can't have normally talked to us. Was he running off? The <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stop and say hi. They don't expect <laughs> that out of you, man. Yeah. But yeah, I guess the statute's limitation. It's probably been over 40 years. Yeah. So. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And yeah. it was a thing. I mean, around here back in the day, we, get a little poor well you just have to go harvest the deer yourself and of course now we're a little bit more conservation minded when it comes well to i i looked at the it deer better than butchering one of the neighbor's cows yeah well, i that's, mean you that's know. just it yeah. and so yeah I, I always thought that was a pretty funny story but i i often wonder why i turned out to be half outlaw and i guess these stories <laughs> prove why half outlaw half thief <laughs> yeah yeah uh, mostly yeah. christian yeah 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 <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes we uh, we relapse into old things. But uh, one thing I want to, if any law officers are out there listening today and might be listening to this, I want to reassure them that I'm getting too darned old to do that. So uh, yeah, it doesn't happen. No, no worries here for me, man. I often wonder why I got in so much trouble in my early twenties, and I think I was just trying to relive the seventies. <laughs> yeah well uh, you know it seemed like that's what you call father influence <laughs> well you know you watch you know all those uh, early burt reynolds movies and Smokey and the bandit and hooper and stuff and oh yeah they always run around with the beer and hanging uh, out well uh, fighting think, fighting the man yeah yeah you know but just yeah just part of your birthright to be half hillbilly and run around the country well i don't fly, quite fly in the city that's for sure no no but hey, we should call it. But uh, yeah, to all you fathers out there, thank you for everything you do and keep doing what you do. Yeah, we appreciate and thanks, it. Thanks, Dad, for being a good father. Uh, thank you for being a 
good father when I didn't expect that much out of you. Oh, well, that really makes me feel good. Because <laughs> you were a difficult son sometimes. Most of the time. Yeah. I, my job. But that's okay. Got to get even somehow. Yeah. Well, may the good Lord take a liking to you. We'll see you next time. Sounds like a deal. <laughs>